Hello, welcome back. Thanks for watching. So what I've got for you today is a video that takes you through the second half of the secularization topic, year two Christianity. I've already done part one, so check that out if you haven't already. Um, so you can see here what I'm going to talk you through. We're going to finish off militant atheism, talk about McGrath's responses to Dawkins. We're going to look at the value of wealth and possessions. Um, a little bit on materialism and capitalism. That's going to take us into new forms of expression. There's two particularly you need to know, fresh expressions and about the house church movements. Um, a little bit on liberation theology, um, both in the UK and abroad. And then some final thoughts, which will help you um, do an AO2, a 15 marker, or maybe even a dialogues question on this about whether secularization really is a threat to Christianity. OK, let's go. OK, so here we've got Alistair McGrath. You probably remember um, The God Delusion, which is Richard Dawkins's book. Big bestseller, very, very popular, but controversial book. Um, and many theists were really quite angry about that book because they felt that it really misrepresented what it meant to be a person who had a faith. Um, and this chap, Alistair McGrath, he decided that he was going to write his own book responding to what he saw as the flaws of the God delusion. Um, so he called it the Dawkins delusion. Bit of a burn. Um, McGrath's got an interesting background. He was actually, um, he, he grew up without a faith. And then um, I think it was Oxford that he went to. He was studying sciences and he actually came to have a faith while he was at university and ended up as quite a distinguished theologian. So he's written this book and what he's not trying to do is show that Christianity is true. I think he knows he can't do that, but he's trying to call out what he sees as the real problems with Dawkins's book. So his argument is essentially that Dawkins is making arguments that can't be defended. So he's trying to show how that goes. And he has quite a lot of them. So here we go. McGrath's criticisms of Dawkins, which he writes in his, in his book, um, The Dawkins Delusion. First of all, he claims that Dawkins is wrong to assume or to say that science necessarily leads to atheism. Dawkins just assumes that it does because it has for him. But many top scientists like Francis Collins, who's heavily involved in the Human Genome Project and the late John Polkinghorn, who you will have studied elsewhere in the course, because um, he's got quite a big section in Christianity and science, they saw no problem with being Christians. And they both argued, actually, that the, si the more science they did, the more they discovered, the more their faith was strengthened. Um, so on to the second point, McGrath is not on board with this view that Dawkins has that science disproves religion. Dawkins thinks that you can't have both at the same time. It has to be one or the other. If you're religious, then you're basically denying science. If you're scientific, you'll see that religion is nonsense. McGrath's not having that. He sees them as, I mean, the words he uses are partially overlapping magisteria. That's a little bit of a fancy way of simply saying you can have both because they can enrich each other. The more science blows your mind, the stronger your faith might be. And your faith might lead you to have more curiosity about God's world and that can lead you to do science. So he doesn't really accept this view at all that science disproves or kills off religion. A big problem that he has with Dawkins is the idea that Dawkins presents all Christians as though they're fundamentalists who take the Bible literally. So this is what we call a straw man argument that McGrath is calling out Dawkins for. Dawkins does have a tendency to do this. He does present sort of the worst of Christianity, if you like, by holding up examples that are not really defendable by anybody. So saying that, you know, Christians believe in this bloodthirsty God of the Old Testament and believe that it's right that God slaughtered all these people in all these stories in the Old Testament. Well, actually, that's not fair. That's not true. Most Christians might think, OK, well, there's probably a reason why those stories are there in the Bible, but that doesn't mean that I take it literally or that I, 
think that's really what God is like. So McGrath's beef with Dawkins here is that he shows no kind of nuance in dealing with that. He accuses Dawkins of confirmation bias. Um, this is a cognitive bias that people do all the time. But he says Dawkins is like a really obvious example of it. Confirmation bias is when you only accept evidence that agrees with what you already think. So if you've made up your mind, you're not really open to having your mind changed because you'll only accept evidence that backs up what you already think. And on that point as well, he accuses Dawkins of the same kind of fundamentalism that Dawkins finds so horrible in religious people. His whole kind of thing is that religious people are so fixed minded and aren't open to being wrong. But if Dawkins is not open to the idea that he might be wrong, isn't he just guilty of a different sort of fundamentalism? Now, McGrath's book isn't perfect. There are things that he says that are a little bit tricky to defend as well. And it's not going to be something that completely destroys Dawkins's arguments. Well, you can make up your mind about how good you think these arguments are. But he does have some pretty solid criticisms there of what Dawkins says. OK, so we're into the next little bit now, talking about materialistic secular values. A couple of key terms for you. Materialism is a value that has come out of the secular world, out of the non-religious world. And materialism is when you think that wealth and possessions are the most important things in life when you, you kind of you measure your self-worth and your success by how much money you've got what possessions you own maybe not what car you drive maybe how big of a house you live in things like that tied to that is something you'll know about if you do business or econ um, capitalism so capitalism is the kind of economic system that we're living in. It's a political system, it's an economic system that's geared towards encouraging individuals and businesses to make profit with the idea that that profit can be used to reinvest and enrich people personally. And you know, it's basically saying that wealth is a good thing. Now, these are 20th century secular values that have obviously made their way into the 21st century where we are, but they're not necessarily incompatible with Christianity. Christianity might not always have had them, but it doesn't mean that they can't be made to work to some extent. Let me tell you what I mean. So a little bit here on Jesus's teachings on wealth. I'll talk about the picture in a sec. Jesus didn't really get on board with this idea that if you were wealthy, it was a blessing from God. So he didn't think that rich people were closer to God than poor people, probably quite the opposite, actually. But he never says it's wrong to be wealthy. He never goes that far. There's quite a lot that he says about wealth and money. But the fact is, he did rely on wealthy people to support him, support his ministry. So it would be a bit inconsistent if he was saying that it's wrong to be rich. There is a teaching that I've got here that has confused people for many, many years. It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. On first glance, it looks like that's saying, if you're rich, you can't go to heaven. I don't think that is what it's saying. It's probably saying something like, you can't buy your way into salvation, or you can't buy your way into heaven, your money is no good there. So it's basically saying that money is something of this world. It's not of the next world. It's it's not something that's relevant in heaven. Now, the picture here is illustrating the story of the rich man and Lazarus, which is a parable Jesus told. Long story short, Lazarus begs this rich man. He sits outside his house. Um, he begs for scraps for spare change. The rich man ignores him. They both die. Lazarus goes to heaven. The rich man goes to hell. But it's not because he was rich. He doesn't go to hell because he was rich. He went to hell because he refused to help someone in great need, even though it really wouldn't have cost him anything to do that. So you can probably interpret that without too much difficulty. What Jesus is getting at there in that story is that 
the fact of you being wealthy is not as relevant as how you use your wealth. Let's move on a little bit and look at Christian attitudes to wealth today. And we're actually going to start here with some extremes. So both these examples are mentioned um, in the textbook. We've got the Bruderhof and we've got something called the Prosperity Gospel. Now, the Prosperity Gospel is something that you see quite a bit in um, the USA, particularly in Bible Belt states. So the southern states of the USA. It's a kind of movement that's arisen in Christianity that teaches that wealth and financial blessings are a gift from God to people who give generously back to the church, particularly to do evangelism. Now, this is very controversial because it doesn't really fit well with Jesus's teachings on the poor. It ends up with a lot of money being kind of channeled back into churches. And there's been some controversy with um, pastors and church leaders driving around in flash cars and having mansions and helicopters and stuff. That's it as its most extreme. Um, but the basic gist of it is that you should be grateful if you're wealthy because that shows that God loves you. Your wealth is a gift from God. If you're healthy and happy, that's all a gift from God. And it does make people slightly uncomfortable because it carries an implication that if you're poor or if you're struggling, then you somehow deserve that or God doesn't um, see you as worthy. So that's a little bit debatable. Right at the other end of the extreme, we have the Bruderhof. Now, this is a very, very small Christian sect, only a few thousand members. It's a sect, not a cult. It's definitely not a cult. But the reason there's not so many members is because they have quite an extreme lifestyle. They live very, very simply. They share all possessions. Nobody has any of their own money. It's all just provided by the community. Everything is communal. All food is shared. All wages are shared. Nobody actually owns anything. Um, and they shun all wealth. They're not materialistic at all. And the reason they do that is trying to live like the earliest Christians who shared everything. So those are the two extremes of attitudes to wealth today, but it probably won't surprise you that that doesn't reflect most Christians. Most Christians are somewhere in the middle, somewhere in between, um, particularly in the West, which is very capitalist. It's quite hard to get away from wealth altogether. So Here's some basic principles. Responsible wealth is important. It's not sinful to be rich, but it would be to exploit people or to use your wealth not to do good. Um, a good example that we can give you is the Cadbury brothers who set up Cadbury's chocolate, as you probably know. Um, they were Quakers. Quakers are a branch of Christianity, a denomination of Christianity. Um, the Cadbury brothers set up shop in Birmingham. Um, the factory is still there. It's now Cadbury World, but they still make chocolate and they built the village of Bourneville for their workers and they made sure that the housing was really good quality and there were open spaces, leisure facilities, that their workers could get medical help, that they had um, appropriate time off because their Christian upbringing and their Christian principles showed them that even though they were running a very successful business, there was just no need to exploit people. If you treat your work as well, you can run a good Christian business, a good ethical business. Um, so a lot of Christians accept that wealth is OK. Some people are always going to be wealthy. But if you're that lucky, you should share your wealth generously. People in need should obviously be helped. Um, and this can be seen in the work of lots and lots of Christian charities. People who are lucky enough to be wealthy and who are Christian are encouraged to give very generously to these charities. OK, new forms of expression. So we're moving away from militant atheism and um, beliefs about wealth and money into a kind of response that the church has had to secularization, essentially thinking, OK, how can the church stay relevant in the age of secularization. So the picture in the background of this is an example of fresh expressions. Um, this one is a thing from a church in York 
we've got the former Archbishop of York um, in the back there on the left. So this can be described as different ways of doing and being church. And to make a long story short, it's about reaching out to people instead of expecting people to come to church. So it's very much about meeting people where they are. It's designed to be flexible, very inclusive, um, relevant to people's daily lives. Now, you can Google examples of fresh expressions, but I've just got a few here. So messy church um, as church is doing Lego church sessions. Sunday Active, which is a kind of exercise based one. There are ones that work with homeless people. Um, there's all sorts going on. And the starting point isn't to tell people that God exists or tell people to be Christians. The starting point is simply to discuss the relevance of Jesus's teachings to life today and say to people, hey, you know, this this might be relevant to what you're going through. This might be something that you want to think about. You know, Jesus went through this as well. This is what he did. And so you're not trying to convert people. You're simply trying to draw out the meaning and importance in people's lives and figure out what really matters to them rather than telling them what's important. But then as you do that, you show how Christianity might have a relevance. It might have something that they want to get on board with. So Fresh Expressions has been very, very successful. And as I say, you can look it up and find out more. But what strikes me about it is that it really embraces the challenge of secularization. It's saying, OK, yeah, we live in a secular world. We live in a secular country. Let's lean into that. Let's go and meet people who are not in church. Let's go and be church in a different way. Now, the other one that you need to know about is what's called the house church movement. This is a little bit different. Fresh Expressions, like I said, embraces secularisation, but the house church movement is more trying to take it back. To, it, it, it's more old school. It's trying to return to the days of early Christianity. And in the very, very earliest days of Christianity, there weren't really any churches because worshippers would meet in each other's houses because they were persecuted. They had to avoid persecution, so they had to meet in secret. There are house church groups that belong to a particular denomination, but lots of them don't. They're quite often self-governing, so they don't see themselves as belonging to a particular denomination. They don't really report to anyone. They kind of do their own thing. The focus tends to be on individual experience of God. So people might talk about how they feel God is working in their lives, personal testimonies of why they are Christians, um, Bible study. It can be the case that there's a literal or near literal interpretation of the Bible going on, but not always. That's important to know. You get variation in the house church movement, just like in any other branch of Christianity. Um, but I think the key takeaway is this. While Fresh Expressions is kind of reaching out and taking a hold of secularisation, the house church movement pushes back. It's saying, you know, secularisation is a bad thing. We need to go back to our roots. We need to take Christian worship back to its basics. OK, so we're coming towards the end now. We've just got a few little bits to do. The social relevance of Christianity. This is basically saying if most people in the country now aren't Christian, which for the first time the 2021 census has shown is the case, what's what's the role of Christianity? What what job does it do in people's lives? I think it does remain socially relevant. It definitely remains socially relevant. Churches play a role in times of hardship or tragedy. Um, in times when something really terrible happens in a community, the church is often the focal point for people to come together. Churches do all sorts of things to support their local communities, food banks, warm spaces, free activities for parents and kids, um, somewhere for the elderly to go. And they're doing this because it needs to be done, but they're also doing it because it can be an act of worship. It's reflecting this idea that Jesus 
put people before anything else, before the laws, before the social norms of the time, and also reflects the belief that through Jesus, God becomes imminent in the world. God becomes involved. And that doesn't stop with Jesus's ascension. It continues today through the inspiration of Jesus and through the Holy Spirit. So liberation theology, you may have come across already um, in the topic on Christian feminism. Liberation theology, the simple version of it is it's the view that whatever else Jesus was, he was there to set people free. He wanted to make people free. The truth will make you free. And therefore, Christians today should follow suit. They should work to liberate people from all kinds of oppression, wherever that oppression is coming from. Straight away, that means that they've got to engage with the secular world, because very often this oppression is coming from the secular world. So an example here, and this is the picture, this is Oscar Romero. Um, he died in 1980. He was a Catholic Archbishop in El Salvador, in Central America. Um, and at the time, El Salvador had a lot of problems. It still has some problems, but people were being very, very badly oppressed by the government. And Oscar Romero gave a speech encouraging the army not to obey the orders of the oppressive government. He basically said, no, you, you don't have to do this. You don't have to be an instrument of oppression. You can be part of the solution. The very next day, he was shot dead. And as a result, he's seen as exceptionally brave. He's seen as a symbol of liberation theology, and he's seen as a martyr because his death made the world sit up and pay attention to what was going on in his country. Now, liberation theology in Britain can look different from that because we don't have um, the levels of oppression that we do in some countries, but we have our own problems. So the liberation approach in Britain, again, means intersecting with the secular world. It means intersecting with secular problems. So it can look like lots of things. Lots of churches will campaign. They might do lobbying, lobbying their MPs, putting pressure on their MPs, organising protests, going to protests and doing what they can at a really basic local level to overcome injustice and poverty. Very often they work in conjunction with non-religious groups, with um, non-profit organisations, other secular charities. So there's a real um, blending of the religious and the secular here. Like we've said already, churches do an awful lot. They provide food, clothing, warm spaces, all sorts of other practical help, advice, um, signposting other supports. And they do this to the poorest and most vulnerable, just like Jesus did. And this is demonstrating this idea that Part of being a Christian means that you have to roll your sleeves up and get stuck in. You have to engage with secular problems. You have to put yourself forward to be part of the solution. So people who do this, who are Christians, they basically argue, well, it's no good to just pray for things to be better. It's no good to just hope for things to be better. It's no good to just check out of society and say, well, it's all up to God. Maybe God has put us here to do this, and that's what we're going to do. OK, so some final thoughts. Is secularisation actually a threat to Christianity? The short answer is probably not massively, but it's certainly changing Christianity. Something that could be perceived as a big threat to Christianity is militant atheism. Millicent's atheism is on the rise. Atheism in general is on the rise. We can see that from the census. But it's easy to challenge people like Dawkins when they make their arguments in the way that they do. And lots of people in Britain respect and appreciate the work of their local churches and they wouldn't want to see that stop. I think if you asked local people, even if they don't go to their local church, would you want to see it burnt down? Would you want to see it turned into a Tesco Express? Mostly, I think they wouldn't because they, they understand that it's doing a job. 
and it's there for the people who need it and they're fine with that. There's no doubt that the political power of the church is not what it was. Um, the church used to be in charge of nearly everything. So secularisation has diminished the power of the church, but that was always going to happen particularly when the UK started to become a multi-faith society, a multicultural society. Um, we embedded freedom of religious expression as one of our values. That includes the freedom to be an atheist. It was always going to go like that. So even though the church doesn't have the power it once did, you could argue that it's not a bad thing because the church can still play a very important role and it's there for the people who want it and need it. A lot of Christians embrace the challenge of secularisation. Um, liberationists do. Um, people involved in the fresh expressions movement do. But others look to push back against it and go a little bit more insular, go a little bit more back to the very basics of Christianity, trying to block out the secular world a little bit. And we see that slightly in the house church movement. So you can make up your own mind as to whether secularisation is a threat to Christianity. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to write your AO2. You can decide that. Um, but I hope you have found the video useful. I'm going to be doing some more very soon on the final year two topic, um, migration and pluralism. So until then, take care and I'll see you soon.